as long as you come at it from a perspective of humility and knowing that your first steps are not going to be your last steps, then I think that just going ahead and starting with whatever's in your mind, okay, I can do this. I can do this. Um, so let's start there and see where it leads. Welcome to Arts Engines. I am your host, Aaron Dworkin. And with us today, we have Stephen Banks. Uh, as with all of our guests, you can check out his full bio and all of that online. He's an extraordinary saxophonist. Uh, actually, I believe the first to be on Young Concert Artists roster, regularly performs with the Cleveland Orchestra, is on faculty at Ithaca College, uh, and is an extraordinary champion for works by black composers. And we're gonna check that out as well on today's show. So with that, welcome Stephen. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to get to chat with you today. And, uh, and so it's great I mentioned that kind of that you were the first saxophonist on YCA's roster. I should also share with everyone, this week's show is co-curated with Young Concert Artists, who's one of our wonderful and extraordinary creative partners for Arts Engines. Uh, so, but what was that uh, experience like with, with YCA? I mean, I know they've, you know, impacted so many artists' lives in, in extraordinary ways. What was that experience like for you? Well, in short, it was a dream come true. Um, I, as a saxophonist, as a classical saxophonist specifically, I think you just really need a chance. You need a shot to get out there and perform in front of people and to have a chance to do the touring because you can't change minds unless you're there in the room. So um, being a part of the Young Concert Artist roster has, has been so helpful for me um, to get some exposure, um, but also to bring light to all of the issues that I'm so passionate about. It, it, they, they give me, in, in a way, um, a voice to many of the passions that I've had for, for many years. So for example, um, I, I've already uh, started the commissioning progress, process for three new works by black composers. And I've only been on the roster uh, since November. Um, and one of those pieces is, is by myself. Um, and one of them is by the composer Carlos Simon. And one is um, still sort of in the early stages, but a saxophone concerto by uh, Billy Childs, who is a fantastic composer. So um, these are opportunities that I certainly would not have had otherwise. And so I'm eternally grateful <laughs> for those um, opportunities. That's awesome. No, it's amazing and of course an extraordinary organization. Um, so kind of before we get into, because I really want to delve a lot more into this process of, you know, commissioning and, and also composing and just kind of an, and how that works and especially how a lot of our viewers uh, might begin to think about it for themselves. But, but before that kind of where, how, did, how did you kind of get your start? You know, how did you start out? Um, what brought you to the saxophone? And, and from there, what kind of brought you even beyond that into composition? Yeah, so um, I started out as I think many saxophonists do in the, you know, middle school band program. Um, I actually started on clarinet, um, but I always saw the saxophone. It seemed so beautiful and it was so loud, made a bit, made a bigger sound and all the keys and whatnot. And so <laughs> why, and it's why these types of programs and exposure for young people is so important so that mm -hmm. you can get introduced to these instruments at an age where you can really build with it, it sounds like. Right. Yeah, definitely. And going off of that same idea, um, I became more serious about playing um, saxophone, classical music, when my first um, university teacher actually came to my high school jazz band sectional and played a, a, a solo piece for us. And I was completely blown away. I had never heard the saxophone sound so, um, so subtle and so sincere and so round and all these great things that I, that I love about it. Um, and so I decided to go study with him 
at that at that point. And so that's when I got serious about the saxophone. Um, but I think that I got serious about my greater sense of purpose in the music community uh, when I was in my master's degree at Northwestern. And I was in my second year and as many people do in their second year of, of, or, of their masters, they're starting to think about, well, what am I going to do in life? Right. <laughs> and um, I started having conversations with myself and having to really sort of think about the deeper questions of what it means to be a musician. And that's when I started reflecting on sort of my experience as a musician and, and started realizing um, how othered, I had just always felt as a as a musician in the conservatory and things that I had just never even considered not feeling um, like being the only person in the classroom or the only person in an ensemble that looks like me. I, I just had never really <laughs> even thought about them because it was so second nature. Um, and at that point I got I got really passionate about changing that for myself and for future generations uh, of musicians. And so I started learning a lot more about black composers um, throughout history. And um, that was actually one of the first times that I felt compelled to write music because all of a sudden I felt more like my voice mattered because throughout history, going back to the 1700s, our voices had mattered in, in this type of music. And um, it was a real deep uh, revelation um, for me that has completely changed my life, I think. Wow, that is just extraordinary. And I know, you know, when I was uh, studying at Michigan, same thing, I went into a lesson one day and my teacher said, you know, do you want to play music by black composers? And I didn't know there were any and <laughs> began to learn about that. And so when you began that kind of journey of, of discovery, um, of these works, was it difficult or how did you go about finding out about these works or about this history that, that you may not have been aware of before? And along with that, can our audience follow those same, same footsteps? How could they learn about the, this extraordinary history and a lot of this music? Mm. Well, yeah, it was difficult. Um, but I think at this point, there are enough resources out there where you can at least make your own path to try to find what you're looking for. Um, so I actually remember at that, at that time, I started talking to some of my professors and they pointed me towards you. Um, and I reached out and we were able to, to chat and you told me about Joseph Boulan actually for the first time. And I will never forget the first time I heard Joseph Boulan's music because I, I literally sat in my apartment and cried because there was something there. I connected with it in some way that I just could not really express. Um, and so um, I think that it was maybe from that point that I decided that even if it's difficult to find these people that I'm really, really passionate about looking for them anyway. Um, and this also set me on a path of trying to change what happens in the academy as well in terms of making sure that other people wouldn't have to wait until they were graduating from their master's to hear many of these names. So um, I think for our listeners, um, there are a lot of places to, to look. For musicians specifically, um, Rob Diemer's Institute for Compositor, C Composer Diversity is a great place to start looking for repertoire um, by black composers, female composers, composers of color in general. Um, I, I think that's a really good place to start if you're just looking to, to get in, in, into this for the first time. You could, you could stay in there for hours. <laughs> Totally. Awesome. Great. So in terms of, you know, kind of one of these statistics that always, you know, it's just kind of still, you know, haunts me, which is, you know, in our orchestral world that, you know, less than 1% of all the works performed by all American orchestras are by any composer of color. So obviously I think in a lot of our audience members want to change that 
paradigm, that, that history, um, want to change the trajectory of that because they, they see that there's extraordinary value, not only just for their audiences, I think, but also for the musicians themselves and what they have the opportunity to perform. But I know that in a lot of conversations I sometimes have, um, you know, our, our orchestras, like any, you know, the organizations set up, different people need to make decisions and also regular work is there. And, you know, you've got things, and, and especially with the pandemic, you know, things are even tougher. Um, so for those who might feel like, I would love for our, you know, repertoire to be more diverse, but to be frank, like, we're not sure where to start or, you know, what to do, what would be your recommendation for, you know, orchestras or large ensembles that are looking to try to diversify what they perform? Well, I think the, the first piece of advice would just be to start. Um, regardless of all of those things that might set you back, um, just start, even if it's maybe right now it's one piece and then you start realizing, oh, well, maybe just one piece is not really a, a, the best way forward. And then you do an entire concert. And then you say, well, that's probably not enough either. Um, and then you start realizing more of the nuances uh, of how to do this in the best way possible um, by diversifying your, your board and diversifying the conductors that you bring in and diverse, you know, because they will all have different um, areas of expertise, um, diversifying your musicians and those things sort of happen as maybe a snowball effect. As you, as you get your feet wet, then you learn more and you continue learning more. Um, so as long as you come at it from a perspective of humility and knowing that your first steps are not going to be your last steps, then I think that just going ahead and starting with whatever's in your mind, okay, I can do this. I can do this. Um, so let's start there and see where it leads. Awesome. Great. So as you kind of look at, you know, it seems like a lot of people are like, it's impossible to plan now with all of the things going on in our society and especially the pandemic kind of, you know, where are things going to be for me? Do you, do you have kind of a, a plan for this next year? What's, uh, what's, what's coming up? What's your sense of kind of some of those key things that you want to make sure you accomplish uh, for this next year? Well, um, for me personally, I think a lot of it is, has been related to learning really how to use technology. <laughs> um, because so many things are possible. I can, I can keep performing as long as I have um, good microphones and a uh, good camera and things that, that make it all look um, to a level that I'd like for it to. Um, and if I learn how to package it in a certain way and, and my students can keep having a meaningful experience as long as we're all able to hear each other <laughs> um, and, and things like that. So I think at this point I've, I've sort of settled in to the pandemic lifestyle. And I realize now I still have a need to share music. I still have a need to advocate. I still have a need to write music. And I can still do all of those things. I can still collaborate with other musicians. I, I recently started a vlog series called um, Curious Dyads. And it, um, it's sort of a cross between a vlog and a podcast and a performance outlet. So, um, I, I interact with other musicians that I really, really admire, and we have a conversation, and then we also do a collaborative performance at the end of each episode. And so things like that have just been really keeping me feeling expired, inspired, not expired, <laughs> 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 feeling really inspired right. because um, some of those people I wouldn't have had the opportunity to collaborate with otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and being new to the young concert artist roster, in a way, this sort of levels the playing field. So those people that I might have been nervous to interact with before, now I can just say, hey, let's do something. You're not doing anything. <laughs> so <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And, you know, it sounds like from this, you know, I hear a lot of people where, you know, they kind of certain things arose or they were either forced into or thought of because of the challenges of the pandemic but then they actually find that there are some extraordinary opportunities that were created and things they might even continue once things, you know, at least settle down in terms of the health crisis. 
do you find that is will be the case that kind of those things that some of these things that you've initiated you'll keep going even after the the health crisis has passed absolutely um i it's really funny you say that because even just um, right before um, I had the chance to talk with you today, I was doing a, an Adobe Premiere Pro workshop for the other faculty at Ithaca College, which for me is totally wild. Um, I'm not really a technology person. And so having those skills are going to, those skills are going to be with me for, for life. Awesome. Great. So, well, unfortunately, we're just about out of time, but kind of one last question. I always like to kind of get, you know, this added kind of personal sense of, of our guests, but, you know, with the challenges, you know, that you have to face from, you know, whether it's the pandemic, but also, you know, this, you know, portfolio life as a, as a musician, as a composer, uh, as I would say, someone bringing a social impact to our field and to our communities. Um, when times get, you know, tougher, there's that tough day, where, where do you find Kind of your inspiration to to move forward and to to get past the the tougher obstacles that present themselves well recently i've i've found inspiration in people and in nature actually so um my my vlog series has forced me in a way to be interested in what other people are doing and to be interacting with people that I find really, really fascinating. And so just being in touch with them has kept, has made me feel really, really inspired and, and kept me going. Um, and those sort of collaborations have helped a lot. But then also, um, I, I live in Ithaca, New York, and it's totally beautiful up here. There's waterfalls everywhere, gorges. And so when I am really in a rut, you know, no matter what, I can get out and be in the most beautiful, serene um, place you could possibly imagine. And so that has really, really helped me uh, with all the stay at home orders and, and things like that. Um, because nature and the world still goes on <laughs> you know it it doesn't feel like there's a crisis outside by by the brook <laughs> you know um so that's helped a lot awesome well stephen banks you truly are one of the great arts engines that is powering <laughs> human creativity in our world thank you so much for joining us on the show thank you so much for having me this has been fun <laughs> Thank you.